Okay, hello people. Um, this is Libid's day two, and here are some learning objectives that we should be able to cover throughout this video. So after watching this video, you should be able to define key vocab terms. There's only a few in this video. Recognize um, steroids and eicosanoids. Compare the functions of energy storage, membrane lipids, and signaling lipids. So today we're adding um, signaling lipids to our, our repertoire of lipids. Describe um, some functions of steroids and eicosanoids and compare the functions of steroids and eicosanoids based on structure. So the reason that this video is separate from the lipids and energy, I'm sorry, the membrane and energy storage video, which was last time, is because one, it gets really long, and two, throwing the lipids on to that previous video um, mm -hmm. tends to put people <laughs> over the edge. So I, I decided to create their own day um, so that they got the attention um, that they deserve. So we're going to talk about steroids first, and then we're going to talk about eicosanoids second. And I just want to remind you where we left off roughly last time was with the structure of sterols. So they're mostly um, nonpolar. That's their nonpolar tail, and their polar head group is this alcohol. And sterols are membrane lipids. They provide structural support. Um, and they optimize the fluidity of the membrane at different temperatures. And sterols are the basis for steroids. Okay, so the structural basis for sterol, um, again, is that steroid nucleus, the OH, and the long nonpolar tail. When you oxidize these, oxidize, oxidize, I don't know why I'm whispering that. Um, and in, in biochemistry, really, when we talk about oxidizing, we add oxygens. So the steroids in here is a table of steroids. It's not all the steroids. It's just some of them. You'll notice that they all have at least one more OH or oxygen in them somewhere. Some of them have many. Oh, this one has a whole bunch. Um, sometimes the uh, the alcohol is a ketone instead. Food for thought. Okay, so all the steroids are oxidized sterols, and that really influences their function because their structure has not changed. So when we add all the oxygens, we actually increase the solubility in water, which means these signaling li lipids can travel throughout the body in the bloodstream. And that's simply because they're more water soluble because they have more oxygens on them and can form lots of favorable interactions with water um, all of these would be hydrogen bonds. And so I just want to give you a list of some functions um, of steroids. Let's do a different color. Um, steroids are, uh, re are important for regulating or controlling metabolism. They're important in inflammation. Immune function, uh, muscle and bone synthesis, and there's a whole bunch of other functions, but I just wanted you to see that they have a wide variety of functions, and these functions occur throughout the body, and the reason that this is possible is because these lipids, and they're still considered lipids because they're mostly nonpolar, um, uh, are more oxidized and can travel throughout the body. So I found this figure, and I kind of wanted to walk you through it um, just to give you an idea of a very vague, cartoony, general idea of what happens when um, a steroid reaches its target cell. So this looks like a very generic eukaryotic cell. There's a nucleus, there's a cytoplasm. Um, there's all sorts of, uh, I don't know, 
just very broad general things going on. But where the steroid would link up is very, very specific and they don't they don't attach to all cells and they don't enter all cells. But the basic um, order of business is that the first thing that happens is the steroid enters. And it can cross the cell membrane relatively easily because it's a lipid and it doesn't really it doesn't typically need a transporter uh, because it itself is a lipid and the membrane is a lipid so it should cross um, should cross easily uh, so it, it will enter into the cell um, and bind with a protein protein receptor. Okay, so here's your protein receptor. They link together. They make this protein receptor complex. We can quantify the strength of this reaction, and that would be KD because the protein here is not an enzyme. Food for thought. And then after this, um, the complex enters the nucleus. And then once it enters the nucleus, it binds to a target sequence. We'll call it specific, specific DNA sequence. And it regulates the transcription of that sequence. You can think of this as like a transcription factor. We'll say it regulates transcription of that particular sequence. So it won't turn on or off transcription of all the protein sequences or all the DNA sequences that will encode for proteins. It's just very specific for a very specific one. And then after this, let's say it's been turned on, it's transcribed into mRNA, just that one sequence. The mRNA is processed, poly A tail. Uh, what's the other thing that happens? Poly A tail, G... Uh, like a methyl group or something on the other end of it. I can't remember. Anyways, it gets processed, and that's how it gets out of the nucleus. And then once it gets out of the nucleus, it is translated by ribosomes. These are ribosomes right here, these little red blobs. And they're translated into new protein, which will go off and, f and fold and have a function. And I don't know, maybe it's involved in breaking down sugar, so it's a glycolytic um, protein. Anyway, so that's a, a very general schematic of what happens when um, a hormone uh, finds its target cell. Okay, so the next one is eicosanoids, and these are my absolute favorite, not only because they're fun to say, but um, they're kind of goofy looking structures, and they do some really interesting things. Um, so eicosanoids are also signaling lipids, um, but they're, instead of going throughout the body, they're more localized, uh, they're localized signals, so they act on nearby cells. So you might imagine maybe um, your stomach lining produces a prostaglandin, and that is helping to signal you know, increase acid production, but it don't, you only want that to happen in the stomach so it doesn't travel very far um, other than like a steroid, which could move from one end of your body to the other end of your body. So all of these are eicosanoids, and there's many types of eicosanoids, and those are prostaglandins, are one type, thromboxanes, that's another type, and leukotrienes um, is another type. You don't need to memorize all of these. Um, at most, I'd like you to be able to recognize the structure of this prostaglandin. And the way that I remember it is because I think it looks like a frog with really long legs. Do you see that he kind of looks like a frog? Okay, that's weird. Anyways, I think it looks like a frog. But you don't have to be able to draw the structure, just recognize it. Um, these are all lipids. And the reason that they are lipids is because they are mostly nonpolar, with just a, li a few polar end groups to them. It's 
just looks messy. Okay, and it turns out one of the functions, one function, there are many functions, is to signal pain um, and inflammation. Uh, other functions in other parts of the body, um, the eicosanoids um, are sometimes evolved in um, allergy response. They can be um, involved in uh, regulating um, abortions and natural childbirthing. So you can imagine that those um, eicosanoids are only produced in that certain localized area of the body. They can be involved in um, regulating the blood pressure and cell growth. Okay, so I'm just going on and on and on. But essentially I want you to see that there's a variety of different functions that they have, and that's because there's a variety of unique structures. But the one we're going to focus on, I've got a little, little small story about, um, is the ones that are involved in signaling pain and inflammation. So all of the substrates for eicosanoids are um, free fatty acids. And most of them are um, arachidonate. And when the enzyme, we'll talk about the enzyme, converts them to eicosanoids, that signal, and particularly prostaglandin in this thromboxane, can signal pain and inflammation. And these are actually the molecular targets for NSAIDs, or non-steroid um, anti-inflammatory drugs. And we're going to talk a little bit about one, because there's one that's been highly studied um, for its structure-based drug design. So the enzyme that catalyzes the synthesis of the prostaglandins are called cyclooxygenases. Cyclooxygenase. Um, they're also called prostaglandin, prostaglandin H2 synthases. Okay. These are membrane associated, so only part, I don't know if you can see this, only part of the protein or the enzyme is embedded in the membrane, and the rest of it is hanging out um, in the cytosolic area. They're membrane embedded because the arachidonic acid, this guy right here, comes from these phospholipid tails. So a phospholipid tail will get cleaved, and the arachidonic acid will travel into the active site of the cyclooxygenase and be cyclized with an oxygen um, into the prostaglandin. And then the product of that ch -ch 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 will travel and leave. It will easily cross the membrane again because it's a, um, a lipid and it will go uh, where it needs to go. This is actually the ER. It's the endoplasmic reticulum that it's attached to. So the enzyme, the two primary enzymes in your body um, that catalyze prostaglandin in, uh, are, catalyze the production of this prostaglandin are cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2. They have slightly different primary structures and just a, a few differences in their tertiary and quaternary structures. Okay, uh, yeah, okay, I'm going to go to this slide. I wasn't thinking I was going to jump here, but we're going to jump here. All right, so cyclooxygenase 1, if it, uh, cyclooxygenase 1 is always, let's call it on, um, and is used for normal housekeeping functions. Cyclooxygenase 2 is the one that's induced in times of pain and inflammation, or to signal pain and inflammation. Okay, so you imagine that maybe um, 
you run into a wall or you accidentally um, cut yourself or you get hit in the face with a two by four, cyclooxygenase two is the one that's going to be synthesized and create the prostaglandins in terms of pain and inflammation. Whereas cyclooxygenase one is just doing some normal localized housekeeping, uh, mostly in the stomach lining. Actually, with the the example that I alluded to earlier with regulating. Um, your stomach lining functions, creating the acid when you need it, not when you not, is the cyclooxygenase one creating that prostaglandin. And the NSAIDs, aspirin and ibuprofen, bind to both because aspirin has this like long, tubey kind of shape that's mostly nonpolar, so that makes sense. Um, ibuprofen also fits nicely here. This is fluorbuprofen. Basically, take off the fluoride and you get ibuprofen. Um, so aspirin fits in both. Ibuprofen also fits in both. So what that means is that at any given time, your NSAID, anti-inflammatory drug, your NSAID is blocking local housekeeping while also blocking pain and inflammation. Now. Rational drug design would tell you that why don't we target only cyclooxygenase 2 for um, reducing pain and inflammation and leave cyclooxygenase 1 alone. So what you're looking at is a figure where it's the empty space in the active site cave. This is the space where I'm looking for my eraser. Um, this red space is the empty space that an inhibitor or an any kind of molecule could fit into. In cyclooxygenase 1, its empty space is very um, long and tube-like, whereas cyclooxygenase 2 has this V-type shaped, um, or L-shaped, depending on how you're looking at it, um, active site because there's a key mutation that occurs that occurs right here, and in cyclooxygenase 1, it blocks it but in cyclooxygenase 2, it's tiny enough and opens up that side pocket. So based on shape alone, rational drug design like this one right here, this is a V-shaped inhibitor, should be able to fit in this pocket and inhibit cyclooxygenase 2, whereas this will never fit in the cyclooxygenase 1 pocket. Kind of cool, right? Um, we'll have an activity in class that goes over this using a physical model. And um, I just think it's a really interesting story. But give your, give your brain time to, time to let it permeate and time to, time to let it sink in or watch the video again or whatever you have to do. I know that this figure is a weird one. You're not used to looking at the empty space in the enzyme active site. You're used to looking at like the side chains and all of the other things are a surface plate. This is this is the empty space. So, um, I think that's all that I have. I'll see you in class. Bye bye.